So I will talk today uh, pretty briefly about some of the work I've been doing since the start of pandemicing, trying to understand uh, uh, the mechanism of maturation from the SARS-CoV-2 main protease. And it turned out to be a study that showed some features in inhibition that were unique in terms of uh, discovery. So let me just very briefly, uh, everyone I think is familiar with that. SARS-CoV-2 has a genome. It produces a polyprotein uh, that should be maturated in several di distinct proteins. And that work is done by two proteases mostly. One is the papain-like protease. It cleaves in three sites and the main protease uh, that cleaves in 11 sites. Now, an important feature of the main protease is, is that it cleaves its own N and its own C terminal. So, uh, and, and that is combined that the protein, the active form of a protein is a dimer. And it is described in literature from SARS-CoV-1 work from past that the protein must be a dimer to be active or to be completely active at minimum. And all this brings a point how the, so uh, the question was how the protein cleaves his own, uh, it, it, it cleaves his own N and C terminal to become the dimer while it is inactive in the polyprotein form. And this process is called the maturation. Now, uh, just this protein is a key viral target uh, for antiviral development. There are many, uh, there are proven drugs such as Paxlovid and Citrivir for, for that. There are many on development and there have been shown very fantastic results. But the mechanism of maturation is still unknown. The, the questions of maturation that we were trying to ask in this project was, uh, if the protein is only active as a dimer, how the immature form, and the immature form is that form that is not cleaved, that is part of a polyprotein, uh, can cleave, can become active and cleave itself. Uh, does the N-terminal and C-terminal processing are occur within the dimer structure? That means it's a C-sclavage event. Or does it happen between two distinct dimers, which means that it is a trans cleavage event? And what are the conformational, structural conformational changes involved in all these processes? And can that information be used to explore new cavities to, uh, to develop uh, allosteric inhibitors or anything that could be uh, used for drug exploration. So more or less, we are trying to answer those questions. And for, for do, to do so, we have uh, produced three forms of the protein. One form we call the immature form of the protein. Uh, so this is immature MPRO. It contains uh, non-cleavable uh, elements at the any terminal of a protein. So there are three amino acids here that cannot be cleaved by the protein, can, and the protein cannot get rid of by itself. Then we also produce the mature form of the enzyme. Uh, so this is a standard method used by many labs to produce when you add the self-cleaving uh, sequence to the end terminal, and then the protein is capable of cleaving itself and forming an authentic n termini. And we also explored another form of the protein, which was the C451S mutant, uh, containing these any terminal uh, it is any terminal. Uh, sequence that is part of NSP4 and trying to make a protein that was inactive but contained the any terminal extension. And these proteins, they behave really differently in solution and biochemistry. And we try to characterize all those uh, behaviors. So these are the purification. And I, I, I bring your attention here to the these mutant uh, C1445S that uh, we found that it was, so if you, if, you, if you analyze, you could obtain this protein has both tetramers or monomers. So it is a mix of elements. There are double two peaks here of different oligomeric states that can be obtained. And this will be important uh, later. So this is an analysis of what we had in this first generating protein. So we had uh, so this is a FRAT-based activity assay. This, this is the mature enzyme, so the authentic main protease. So it has a really 
well behavior activity profile, the immature uh, form of embryo had very low activity, and the mutant, the C145S mutant, was, had also a neglect activity, but we could still see some activity going on after many hours exploring, but very, very slow activity. In terms of, however, in terms of oligomeric state, the mature form of the enzyme here in blue is a dimer, perfect dimer, perfectly well-shaped dimer. The immature form, so that form containing three extra amino acids at the end terminal, they seem to prevent the dimerization, so the protein was mostly uh, found has it has monomers here. And those two fractions of the C145S, they showed a very interesting behavior. So one, one the tetramer, we can see multiple. So here in, in, in black, we could see uh, multiple oligomeric states ranging from monomers to dimers to trimers to tetramers. And why the monomer, we could see here in dashed black, we could see mostly has monomers. So we got crystals of all these proteins, uh, all these forms to try and understand. And we were able, so that was early in the so middle of 2020. Uh, so this is the Brazilian synchrotron. They were in commissioning. There was nothing working there. Still, we were able to convince them to and be invited to do the first experiment. There were no robotics in place. So it was a landmark for for us, because it's a fourth generation synchron, and this was the first experiment to be conducted and we saw, I think, five different forms of the enzyme. And what we saw for the structures of these enzymes, well, first, so the structure of immature uh, EMPRO, we, we saw that these uh, extra residues that were present at the any terminal, they were clashing into the, the domain tree of the protease. So here you have a ghost of the wild type position of the domain, and you see that they are uh, humping, they're bumping that up uh, a little bit. And there is a lot of modifications in the active site. So that would explain why the protein doesn't dimerize so well and doesn't have activity. Uh, for, for the crystal structure of in, in the crystal structure of the CS, the C145S main protease, we also saw something really curious. We, we found that the protein, the two, so this tetramer actually was at the time we were thought that it was what was happening, was that the, the uh, protein was processing, uh, the, uh, the tetramer was actually two copies of dimers processing uh the n and the c terminal sorry this is wrong this is the c terminal of uh, of one another so this is the observation of what we call a trans event so the c terminal was being processed by another copy of that and that was the these were the first structures of the uh main protease with their native substrate and it was actually the protein in action that we were seeing because we were we thought we were seeing the trans event of cleavage and more or less confirming that what would be happening here. And coming back to the analysis of biochemistry, what we saw for this uh, C145S MPRO uh, mutant was that it was not exactly a static sample. So we, we, we saw that the sample was actually quite dynamic. So this mutation, although we designed to abolish the activity and uh, that wasn't what was happening what we because uh, we could see in terms of in, by analyzing oligomeric states that over the course of a few days the protein completely changed uh its behavior its oligomeric states and seems to converge into dimers so both tetrameric or monomeric sample no matter where you start uh, you see that there is a shift from monomeric state. So here you have at zero hours, you have the majority of the sample has monomers. And after 24, it, it goes a little bit into dimer. And that, and that also, and eventually will become full dimers. And this seems to be more or less directly proportional to the cleavage of the N-terminal. So we can see here some cleavage of N-terminal. 
Uh, and this seems also not to be so much influenced by the presence of active MPRO in the sample. So we thought at that time that adding MPRO would enhance this any terminal cleavage, but adding doesn't seem to have the effect that we were expecting even in concentrations that we should be seeing activity. So uh, possibly indicating that this must be a cis cleavage event, the any terminal processing. This is the activity of this sample after, after hours of incubation uh, at room temperature. So this is the starting sample. We saw the activity was neglectable, but if you take samples that were left in the shelf for 24 and 48 hours, you started to see activity and you can correlate that with the dimerization that we just saw. So the protein starts to become more active, not because the mutation remains there, it's just that it is now become, um, starting to become a dimer. So with all that, we try to create an event. So basically we, at that point, we were able to elucidate the structure of immature form of the enzyme. So that is a, a sample that had uh, changes that doesn't allow the protein to dimerize, changes in the D3. Uh, we saw the observation of how the protein cleaves the uh, C terminal by forming this tetramer, this dimer-dimer uh, uh, complex, and the release of a mature pro MPRO. So we, we, we published that mechanism, that preliminary me mechanism there. There is a video, I think, can be more, into, uh, can explain better what we saw. So basically, the protein starts as an immature form, then somehow it gets rid of its any terminal, that causes conformational changes in the D3 domain that allow the protein to dimerize. And then there is a trans cleavage event that really removes the C terminal part of a protein out and then releasing the thuma through protein. So these were more or less the mechanisms that we had. And we were mostly sure about the majority of the steps from the immature to the C terminal processing, but the N-terminal processing wasn't something that we saw at that study, just because crystallography doesn't seem to allow. We, although we done some characterization, uh, we still not sure about uh, how that event happened. So we continue to study these in, now in a second uh, paper that was recently published, and we use cryoEM for that. So we took that sample from tetramers uh that we were able to 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 purify and we done cryo em of that sample that was done in diamond at ibic and we were able to solve a structure of of empro by cryo em which was a surprise because that was a really small sample only 68 kilodaltons so cryo em uh challenge difficulties is inversionally proportional to the size, more or less. And it is one of the smallest uh, proteins ever solved in atomic resolution. Uh, that is a little out of date, it's 2020. I'm sure there's plenty more here, but still it was a very fantastic result. However, we didn't solve the tetramer that we were expecting, although the sample was a tetramer. Uh, instead, we found the dimer in solution, so the protein was this dimeric heart-shaped characteristic of MPRO. And there was something in the active site, clear density here, uh, that we, it took us a while to understand exactly what it was, but it was actually the N-terminal part of uh, MPRO. So we got a structure here, a unique structure that was outside of the constraints of crystal environment. And uh, reveal unique features about the binding to the substrate mode of the the M of MPRO into its native substrate, and this was actually when you analyze particles. I I don't know if everyone has the 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 imagination to see that, but this is the best we have. But if you if you have a look at the particles, so you, in the center of this image you have this hard shaped 
uh, uh, particles here, you know, this heart shape uh, that probably are the Ampro, and you see these particle bound, these satellites, uh, particles of Ampro, which are, which are likely uh, unfolded Ampro monomers floating around. So actually, or that trimeric sample was the Ampro bound to non cleaved, uh, unfolded Ampro monomers uh, that were floating around. That tetramer that we got was a crystal artifact, probably due the incubation. Now, I'm not saying that isn't correct what it was doing, but that was not or the original sample. And we continue to studying that sample. Uh, so, Rod uh, at Oxford, Rod Chalk has done an amazing work with. Uh, native mass spectroscopy. And he showed something that was very, very important for our studies that he, he demonstrated that. So this is the spectrum of the that tetrameric sample. And we can see here that we were expecting that the dimers were formed only by uh, cleavage uh, elements of m -prot because that was the original mechanism, right? The, the protein must get rid of the n termini therefore process itself. But that wasn't what we saw. We saw that every single component, so you have monomers in sample, you have dimers in sample, you have trimers and tetramers, and all these components could be formed by all the possible elements, all the combinatory uh, elements that were present. So we could we, we would have uncleaved Un uncleaved, uncleaved particles forming dimers. We had cleavage with uncleaved particles also forming dimer, both cleavage particles, and so on. Uh, for tetramers, the same, all the combinatory possibilities are there. So that was the first hit that we had that cleaving any terminal was not critical to the demerization because all the elements seem to coexist, at least in this sample. And so after that, we started to see, we had that mechanism, that model, that unique uh, system of studying things in solution with this mutant and seeing how the effect, and we decided to study the inhibitor effects on these oligomerization, which was different from everyone else was studying. We, and we done, and we done the study with two molecules. One was MET, uh, POS 51. So that was developed by the Moonshot Consortium. It has a PI, PIC 50 of 7.5. And we also done this study with Nematrovir, which was developed by Pfizer, and, and had also had a very similar PIC 50. The only difference between these two molecules, the only obvious difference is there are many, but it's, uh, it's that one is a known covalent uh, inhibitor and the other one is a covalent inhibitor. And what we done, so this is a summary of the study. So so when, when you take that sample that the start has a monomers and you wait time and an analyze the uh, oligomeric state by sec mouse, what you normally see is this behavior. This is well uh, reproducible behavior, but at zero hours, you have monomers, 100% of the sample, and as the time passes, the sample starts to converge into dimers. And that goes on up to 74 hours. This was done 48 hours. So this is the normal behavior, conversion of monomers into dimers. This is probably related to the cleavage of n termini and the formation of dimer. What we saw when we add uh, MAT51 to this sample was uh, that MAT51 seems to prevent completely the formation of, of dimers, you know, so all these three samples are not processed and they become has unfolded monomers for the rest of their life or, or for a long time. So it was more or less the behavior that we were expecting to see uh, we were predicting that would happen, and that was exactly what happened, prevention. How, uh, however, for Nirmatrovir, we saw a completely different behavior. Uh, so when you measure the sample with Nirmatrovir at zero hours, when, in which you're supposed to see that, you immediately see the conversion of dimers. Uh, 
and that goes to nearly a 100% after the passing time. So this is for the moon. We saw the same behavior for the tetramers. So the tetramers here, uh, you have the sample has tetramers uh, and uh, has a mix of tetramers, dimers, and and monomers, and they seem to converge into mono, into dimers over the passing of days. Uh, when you add a mat to the solution, uh, you see this effect that the, uh, the tetramers disappear, probably because mat competes with these particles bound to unfolded particles. So that was more or less expected. Uh, and you see the same effect from came from the monomer cascade site. So you, you see that it prevents monomers to become dimers uh, over the course of the days. And again, the matter of view has a completely different behavior. It seems to induce the formation of dimers from both sides. So what we did was we try, so we were uh, curious about that. What was the difference between the matter of view? And the question was, could we obtain could we use this sample here incubated with Nirmatrovir to get crystals? And we got a crystal uh, of Nirmatrovir, of this mutant, uh, starting from the monomeric sample, I think. We add Nirmatrovir and we got the structure. And what we saw was that we had an uncleaved, uh, an uncleaved form of Empro that was a dimer. And, and we can see that there is an extension showing that there is uh, non-cleaved, the, the, the particle wasn't cleaved. And this seems to cause the same effect that, that the immature form of the protein uh, that we show in the previous paper when we had extra residues here. However, we have a dimer here and we have an, a less abrupt changes. We have and we and, and this sample and was bound to neumatrovir. So with all that those structures in hand, we we trying to came out with a different mechanism for demerization that wasn't necessarily uh, related to to being cleaved. And the mechanism that we have now, our proposal is that uh, the the trigger for demerization isn't actually being cleaved, but the covalent uh, the covalent uh, linkage that is formed during substrate processing seems to be the cause of demerization, and that and that can be mimicked by a covalent inhibitor such as the matrovir. So for that reason, by and this doesn't seem. The, the same doesn't seem to happen for a non-covalent inhibitor. And what we saw with all these structures that we have here, so we, 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 we combining the two papers, we have structures of all the events. So we had the wild type, uh, EMPRO, we had the cryo -EM structure showing the protein bound to uh, intact substrate, so pre-cleavage. And we had the structure of uh, Empro bound, covalently bound to the C terminal. So this causes dis a disruption on the active site, seems to have this docking, uh, this down, uh, this moving effects on this loop. And after release, so you have a pulse cleavage structure uh, of, of Empro, uh, also in, in another publication, showing that this seems to return to the original position after cleavage. So this click effect might be the cause of demerization, might be the trigger of demerization. But being cleaved, as we show in the native mass and the crystal structure in the is not critical. So to the conclusions of this work were that any terminal was not critical for demerization. The demerization seems to be induced by the covalent linkage, this is the trigger. Uh, the multiple oligomeric states can coexist and act both the cis and trans during the maturation. And all the structure information can guide the development of new generation of MPRO inhibitors targeting specific steps of the maturation process. And 
that was recently a month, about a month ago published in Nature Communications and you can find more. And I would like to thank you all in such short notice for the opportunity to present. And there are many people involved. Sorry if I forgot anyone.